Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on the uh, June episode of I'm a Grand Trophy GFS Forum. <clears throat> I think we are we have enough people on the call and we can go ahead and get started. Uh, we might rearrange the agenda a little bit uh, based on, on, on some of the uh, people who are already in the call. Uh, but I want to start off by saying thank you so much for joining us uh, today. It's uh, such an honor to welcome everyone. Uh, and, and this is a special call for us since we have had a, a very successful uh, legislative session uh, that we um, that just concluded. Uh, and a big part of it was to have the Office of the New Americans established. And, and that's exactly what happened. We had the office established through legislation and uh, we're all set to start on uh, July 1st as um, an office that's now established within the state statute. We had worked on uh, this bill for the last uh, legislative session uh, that we did not pass it through, but this time um, we're, we're happy that it went through. And thank you to everyone who's worked on this bill. I know that early on, even last year, uh, the last legislative session, there was so many support letters, so many um, um, recommendation letters that were written by so many of you uh, community organizations, uh, uh, people like, uh, you know, um, that have worked a lot on this bill, uh, people who have given input on how this bill should be structured. Um, we thank you so much, everyone, for uh, all your efforts. And it pays off. This is an office that uh, everyone at the immigrant and refugee community uh, really was looking forward to. Uh, there was the need uh, when we first started this initiative and this the need still. Uh, to have a coordinating office uh, to expand uh, access to state resources uh, for the immigrant and, and refugee community. So um, it's a great win for everyone. And uh, we look forward to working with you and continuing the work to expand this office and, and make sure we have uh, programs that reflect the communities that we serve. Um, it's always the start. Uh, we hope to uh, continue uh, getting more uh, staff and uh, we hope to start working on hiring one staff right now uh, as of, as of you know, July, uh, but continue to work with the uh, legislative and leadership at deed to, um, uh, to expand the office and bring the services closer to you all. So thank you so much. I wanted to start with that first update and I will save the other updates for, for later. But um, I wanted to see if one second here. Uh, Devin is on the call. Otherwise, we can um, um, start. Yep, Devin, we have you on the call. Let's take it over. Yep, I'm here. Um, let me share my screen here. A quick slide deck. Okay. Everybody able to see slides? Yes, sir. Good. Okay, wonderful. I'm I'm Devin Bowdry, legislative liaison. Uh, I think I've joined you a few times in the past with always kind of like, here's what we're seeing, here's what we think might happen. Um, but now I get to kind of look back and be able to tell you, all right, here's what happened. Um, and so, uh, you know, along uh, as as Assistant Commissioner Muhammad just mentioned, uh, the owner bill past um but then so so much more for deed and oops, this is it at, at a very general level there are so many different programs and, and appropriations that came through um but i'm happy to to walk you through this very high overview um starting off with uh, just kind of a where we were coming into the session you know dfl took control of, of the house the senate and the governor's office um, and then adopted a, uh, along with that a 17 and a half billion dollars surplus. So uh, Assistant Commissioner Muhammad mentioned that that bills didn't really finish going through last session. And last session there was a, a surplus then to I think around nine ish billion dollars that rolled into this year with then additional surplus money being available. Um, so over the all the enterprise, all of state government, um, there was a 72 billion dollar by a budget that passed and then a $2.6 billion um, bonding slash cash uh, package that passed. And then overall the deed received about 1 point billion across the different bills, um, which is much, much more than we've ever 
had before. Uh, so this first category of programs um, we called economic expansion. Um, and I guess throughout, throughout these uh, slides here, you'll see things, uh, some of which were initial D to S, some of which weren't, which weren't, or some things that were funded at maybe a different level than we initially expected or, or came in with. So the forward fund being one of them, we received $400 million for this program. Um, we initially only had asked for $150 million, um, but there was just a lot of interest in using this money to uh, pair with federal legislation like the CHIPS Act, um, the Inflation Reduction Act. So we're trying to use this money to attract a lot of federal dollars into the state for businesses. Uh, next, we have $100 million for our broadband program. Uh, this is grant money uh, for expanding broadband access statewide. Uh, next is the Energy Transition Grant Program. There are several communities that have uh, like coal plants that are starting to retire in the next decade or so. Um, and in some of these places, like communities, it makes up a huge percent of the tax base. So this money is kind of planning dollars to help communities figure out, uh, you know, how to, how to make up that loss, really. Um, not necessarily in a new energy source, but you know what kind of businesses could come in, what kind of jobs could we have here to replace that. Uh, and then last in this group is uh, 11 million to explore Minnesota for business. Uh, this is a kind of for our sister agency, Explore Minnesota, um, but to help market Minnesota as a good place to work and do business and not just the tourism side. Uh, next in our, our growing small business uh, category, First up is uh, the Promise Act, which will look kind of similar and, and build off a program that we had the last couple of years called the Main Street Revitalization Program. This is just money for, for working capital and development. It's got a mix of two components. One component is loans, one component is grants. Um, and so that will be rolling out uh, shortly. Then the Expanding Opportunity Fund is kind of just to, to pair along with the Promise Act. It's to gap fill and be used as uh, small business uh, capital for, for kind of businesses that don't end up receiving anything from the Promise Act. Uh, then we have the Small Business Assistance Partnership Program, which is something that we've had for uh, several years now. This is all technical assistance, uh, getting businesses to in, into a spot um, where they can begin applying for these programs or you know just general business advice. Um, Small Business Development Center support, uh, that's kind of our own internal, the Small Business and Partnership money is granted to partner organizations. Small Business Development Center support is, is in-house indeed. So we offer uh, about 10 hours of consulting to anybody who is starting a business or, or looking to uh, grow just to provide some, some free consulting. And lastly, here on this, on this slide is Launch Minnesota. Um, that's a, a unit indeed that is focused on um, small businesses, particularly in high tech, high growth, um, new innovative type of industries. Uh, next, we have some uh, provisions that came out of the tax bill, um, which is completely separate from our, our main bill in the jobs committee. Uh, so first being the angel tax credit funded at $10 million um, over the next couple years in total, which is less than we had asked for. Um, so we'll, we'll try and look to increase that later on. And that's also a, a tax credit that incentivizes investment in high tech, high growth uh, businesses. And then we have a film board tax credit, which uh, is, goes to like film production um, components and, and labor groups and things like that. And then we also have a couple uh, pieces here, a couple grants. One is to um, High Life which uh, in the news, if you've been hearing about that um, pork processing plant in, in Wyndham, um, that's, that's that uh, appropriation right there. And then $10 million to the city of Minneapolis for Lake Street Council, and then for the purchase of a building. Um, another probably story you've maybe heard in the news, it's the, that Red Roof uh, East Phillips building that has a, a contamination underneath that they were looking to, to tear down. Next, always big for, for DEED is childcare, recognizing kind of the workforce development and economic development and pieces of it. So $15 million for our childcare economic development grant program, um, which is a, a program we've had for the last few years now. 
what would be new is that next piece is the Office of Child Care and Community Partnerships, just having a, an office that's specifically designated to, to focusing on this topic here and how that will interplay with the new department that's being created, the, I think, Children and Fam Department of Children and Families, not sure yet. So to be determined there. Um, DEED will have a, a few small programs as part of the uh, legalizing adult use cannabis uh, bill. Um, so the CAN startup is geared toward business financing and loans. CAN Navigate is focused on uh, technical, assistance to, technical assistance to businesses to kind of figure out the cannabis regulatory structure. So that's going to be a whole nother um, kind of maze to, to unravel. And then lastly, the CAN Train is focused on the workforce development side. So preparing workers for the legal adult use cannabis industry. Uh, probably one of the, the highest profile things that we had this year, paid family medical leave, something we've been working on for several years now um, and finally passed. This provides, you know, partial wage replacement if you um, have a child or shortly after having a child, if you need to care for a, a sick family member. Um, so up to 12 weeks for, uh, for qualifying people. And then uh, there's a maximum of 20 weeks. It's typically like if you um, uh, gave birth and use your 12 weeks and then maybe you have like a, a post-pregnancy complication or something like that, that might extend you to a 20 weeks. So something along those lines. Uh, and then invest in talent. So workforce development is something that we hear a lot about indeed, and especially over the last one to two years, it's been a, a huge topic. So these are, are some of the categories here. Drive for five, we'll focus on uh, uh, five of the top high demand, high growth, high wage industries, getting people trained for that. The clean economy, equitable workforce program. This program is uh, geared toward uh, black, brown, indigenous Minnesotans to prepare for manufacturing construction in the clean energy sector. Uh, targeted populations workforce program. This has three components to it. One is workforce development. One is DEI training for uh, small and medium-sized businesses. And the third is capacity building for nonprofits. And then last on this side, slide is youth workforce development at $20 million. So those uh, that 20 million is going to three different existing programs we have at deed and more on investing in talent the, the reasonable accommodation program uh, this is to incentivize small and medium-sized businesses to um, uh, uh, comply with ada accommodations uh, for people with disabilities to incentivize um, have more hiring with people with disabilities uh, individual placement and supports. This is a program we've had a deed for a while, and that focuses on uh, getting people with, uh, you know, serious mental illnesses into uh, positions that they can uh, do and, and sustain. And then lastly, state services blind. This is kind of a technical uh, increase. Um, we had to, to increase our state match to receive uh, continuing federal dollars. So continuing the work of that division of deed. I think you might know about this one, Office of New Americans and on all the components of that bill that uh, made it to the finish line. So we're very happy to, to, to see this funded for uh, the biennium and ongoing. Uh, workforce digital transformation, this is just uh, to help us make technological improvements. You know, it's not always the, the flashiest uh, appropriation, but if you ever used an old uh, deed um, website, you know, we've, we've got a few, uh, you know, they probably need to be updated. Uh, unemployment insurance between terms for certain school workers. There was a, a provision that's been longstanding in UI law that did not allow, like for example, bus drivers or um, like cafeteria workers to then receive UI over the summer. And so that uh, prohibition has been removed. And I think this is my last slide here, capital investment bill. Um, we had three uh, existing programs, these first three bullets listed here that do uh, sort of uh, public infrastructure grants. Um, we received a new program that's focused on childcare facilities. And then uh, that last uh, sentence there at the bottom, we received a 
a ton of money, several million um, in sort of named appropriations uh, that we will be administering. So all in all about 1.8 billion coming to deep. And that's all I have for you today. I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you, Devin. That was a packed information. And I know that we have uh, great questions in the in the in the in the uh, group. Uh, we'll split some of the questions for, for the back end of the conversation. But um, one qualification was some of the uh, bills might not take effect right immediately after July 1st, like the paid family leave. That's what I understand. Yeah, there are some bills. Um, sometimes things take effect uh, immediately after they're signed into law. If not, usually then they take effect on August 1st. Um, and sometimes you'll see different provisions throughout bills that say, all right, well, we're going to pass it now, but this part doesn't start until 24 or 25. So paid family has so many different components. It's a huge bill. Um, but we will begin, uh, you know, we're already hiring for a, a director for that program now. And then we will uh, begin building the program. It's gonna be a huge lift, but I think in a couple more years is when the program will be fully established. Thank you it so does, much. Does include fathers, yes. It's a pretty broad program. Yep. Yes, and thank you for asking that. Um, not seeing any further questions in the chat, but uh, I'll be happy to um, uh, take those questions as we continue on the call. Uh, but maybe we can do one call, one question from um, Jude, and then we can uh, go into the next uh, presentation. Yeah, thank you, uh, Assistant Commissioner. Um, so my question is, uh, with this uh, flush of money you know, coming to deed, um, is there any plan that, uh, you know, uh, did, did we take this information to the community? I know the Office of New America, they have some work to do, and ethnic councils and others, and even community-based organizations who will be your partner to take this message to the community because, yeah, the money is, is for the community, but in most cases, they wouldn't even be aware I even get ready to access this funding or even participate the way it's going to help uh, to rebuild our community. Yeah, we will definitely be doing some, some outreach coming up here. Um, I know we have on the call our new outreach director. Uh, if she would like to not to put you on the spot, but if she'd like to uh, say hello. <laughs> and then um, I know, I know for, for, our, our community partners, you know, trying to, when we have so many programs, you know, that, that you don't all have all of the resources to apply for every single thing. So making sure that we let you know what's out there and you can pick and choose what seems like a good fit for you. That's always a huge part of it. Community reviewers will be a, a part of this money as well. Um, and yeah, you'll see a, a lot of existing programs that, that maybe community members are familiar with. And then also, uh, some new programs that will be kind of working to figure out how to how to administer best. So, thank you, Devin. Um, before we leave uh, the deed updates, I wanted everyone to meet uh, Ekta Prakash, our new um, uh, director of uh, public engagement, and I will welcome her to come to say a few remarks uh, uh, before we continue to the next presenters. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Mohammed and Devin, for the great presentation. I'm Ekta Prakash. Um, I think I know most a lot of people on this call and I'm excited to see those faces. Um, so now I'm wearing a different hat at Deed and going back to the engagement, I think that's where I'm gonna play some role and work with the team and do aggressive community engagement work. And so um, looking forward to meet, um, I think there are some folks that I don't know and there are many I know. So I'm just looking forward to meet with everyone, but you know, I come from a nonprofit sector. Some of you know uh, from CAPI, 16 years of my work in the refugee immigrant community. So I'm really excited and to bring the value and to collaborate. So I'm looking forward and connect with me and send me email. I can put it on a chat, but I'm excited to work with the so and partner. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. Really appreciate it. and we're excited working with you. Um, uh, welcome to Deed once again.
Um, all right. So we'll go to the next uh, item on the agenda. We have uh, uh, Rita who will take over uh, from here and share with us the opportunities that are there in the long-term care and the outreach campaign that, that uh, her team is, is, is carrying. Uh, Rita, please take over. Yeah, hi, I'm Rita Beatty from Deed Communications and I'll just quickly share my screen here. Hopefully quickly. So um, yeah, I just wanna give a quick overview of the Follow Your Heart to a Caring Career campaign. Um, this is a uh, outreach campaign um, that is sponsored by DEED and the Minnesota um, Department of Human Services. So the, the goal of the campaign is to, as you can see there on your screen, attract, hire, and retain people to provide services. So care and support services in the community, in people's homes and in the community and in facilities for, um, for people with disabilities and elders. Um, so we kicked off last week with a paid advertising campaign uh, paid for by Department of Human Services, uh, but they are evergreen resources. So we're really hoping that people will be able to continue to use them as they explore careers, uh, career pathways in the caring careers. Um, these positions can be a great fit for people who have a high school diploma, maybe like a recent high school grad, uh, someone who's learning English, um, uh, someone who needs a job right now, and of course, most of all, someone who wants to make a difference in the lives of others. Um, and there are a variety of positions in a variety of settings, and a lot of people might not know there is kind of that variety of, of options in working in home community and facility-based care. So individual home care, like home health, group home, working in a group home, um, day program, uh, employment support and other community-based care, and then assisted living nursing home or other residential facility care. Um, as I said, the uh, summer campaign here is uh, paid for by DHS, but these resources will live on. Um, the focus of the outreach is on people who need work now, uh, new Americans, so immigrants, refugees, and evacuees, uh, students, college, and high school age 16 plus for some positions. Some positions you have to be 18 years old. Um, people who are retired from another career are looking to return part-time, and of course, anyone with a heart for this work, so someone who wants to make a difference in the lives of others. Um, along with the paid advertising campaign, which is focused on uh, Google search, Google display, Facebook, Instagram, and ethnic media. So we are doing a uh, campaign in multiple languages. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Moh um, Mohammed was recently uh, on a Somali TV segment about this. Um, we're also doing Spanish language radio. Um, we're also doing um, earned like kind of, you know, statewide and TV and radio outreach, organic social, all using the caring career min hashtag, statewide gov delivery emails. Uh, an email just went out today to about a half a million people, um, which seems kind of stunning. <laughs> and um, communications uh, via industry group networks. So um, industry associations representing long-term care, representing home health, representing the PCA um, agencies and um, others. So they're sharing this information with their members. And then everyone who is interested is, um, is asked to contact Career Force. Um, and there are a variety of ways they can do that. Um, either contacting via the phone number or visiting the website um, or going to one of the many events. There's more than a hundred events set up right now um, where people can learn more about caring career options. So there's career exploration events, hiring events, all sorts of things going on. Um, Governor's proclamation kind of kicked things off uh, last Thursday. He proclaimed June 1st as follow your heart to a caring career day. Press release went out. We did get some media coverage. Um, this is an example of digital Advertising, so we have Google display ads up here, Instagram boosted post and a Facebook boosted post. They're all using the caring career hashtag. Um, they are in multiple languages. Uh, we are working on refining our outreach a bit in this area, but um, we have seen some pretty good success so far, about 15,000 visits to the caring career page generated mostly by these social media and uh, digital display ads. Um, and like I mentioned, we do have uh, uh, many events already posted and we're posting more every day. These are career exploration, job fair and hiring events where people can go and they can find, you know, find out more about positions that might be of interest to them, talk to employers about requirements, um, 
learn what career pathways might be and what employer provided training there might be. So in many cases in, in long-term care, for example, um, employers will pay for nursing assistant training. Um, and many of these events have, or at least some of the events have staff who speak languages other than English. It's just a look at the career fair calendar there. Um, we also have flyers in 10 languages. Most of our content is right now in English, Amharic, Dari, Karen, Oromo, Pashto, Somali, Spanish, Ukrainian, and Vietnamese. Um, the occupational handouts for all of those occupations that you can see there on your screen are also in those languages, so in 10 languages. Uh, there's space on the back where employers can write in their own information or type it in if they prefer, um, so they can use them as in their own outreach. And we also have a career, um, and this handout is in English, but it's very, um, just a, a very good overview of how people can start in uh, entry level caring career positions and move, um, move into higher, uh, you know, career pathways in healthcare, behavioral health, social services, education. Uh, those are the ones that we highlighted on there. Um, I know I kind of whipped through this pretty quickly, so if you do have questions, you can uh, always send them to that email address on your screen. And right now, I would like to um, introduce our guests who were able to join us today. Um, and I'm not sure who all is on, so let me just take a quick look here. Um, Nazneen Katun, are you on from uh, Best Home Health? You might be on mute. Uh, Carrie Scanlon, who's the Vice President for Human Resources at Touchstone Mental Health, and I can see you, so I know you're there. <laughs> um, we also have Patty LaRue, I think, from Human, uh, she's the Human Resources Director at Minnesota Masonic Home. Uh, Patty, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay, great. And then we have Julie, and Julie, I know I saw you on here, Julie Garner Pringle, um, who's the Nursing Assistant Training Program Manager um, for the Medical Careers Pathway at the International Institute of Minnesota. So each of them is going to do just a quick um, kind of introduction of what they do and how they welcome new Americans in their workplaces. And then we'll have a little discussion afterwards uh, uh, facilitated by, by our very own Sahil in, from Career Force. So um, Carrie, do you wanna just uh, kick things off? Sure, thanks so much. Um, so my name is Carrie, and I am the vice president here at Touchstone Mental Health. Um, and I like to consider us a subset of a subset. So what we do as part of healthcare, and healthcare is a growing field. Um, it's definitely a high demand position or field of, of, um, of work. And then of that, there's sort of two areas that I support. One is considered assisted living or long-term care. And the idea with that is we're supporting individuals who need extra support um, to live. And then a smaller sub sub subset of that is behavioral health. So my agency is looking to support individuals who are living with a mental health issue or mental illness. And so we have a really strong commitment to providing person-centered, trauma-informed care. This means we really take into account um, the experiences that our residents or clients have had, the individual goals they want to pursue, and we really work collaboratively with them in order to help them sustain um, and work with their symptoms. And so behavior health is one of the areas where traditionally we've always hired individuals with four-year degrees in so, uh, psychology, social work, and counseling. But the Minnesota Department of Human Services does have opportunities in, in their licensing requirements, which allow people to gain experience and um, promote throughout their ranks in a career based on experience only. So to me, that's really exciting because it allows us to have a more diverse workforce because we have people on our teams and in our programs who are coming from a variety of backgrounds. And it works for us really well because 
One set of programs we offer are long-term supportive housing programs where residents can stay with us indefinitely. Um, and we provide support and food service, counseling, um, medication administration activities. And so our first line staff are mental health assistants. So this is a great position to start in um, and learn about the field and gain a lot of experience. And then a second set of programs we have are for residential treatment programs where residents are with us for 90 days and they're learning to manage their symptoms better. A lot of times they're having issues with their medications or just having more symptoms than normal. And so they can stay with us for 90 days and get some extra support. Um, and so it allows us an opportunity to hire people who have interest in our field, gain that experience with us and be promoted within our organization to other positions, um, supporting again, adults living with mental illness. I'm excited to share, we have a strong commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion as well. Um, and so we have a staff supervisor committee that works on um, moving forward, how we're doing diversity, equity, inclusion. We have a minimum pay of $17.25 an hour. We offer full benefits to anyone working 20 hours or more a week, which I think um, just it helps support um, the staff we're working with. We're getting ready to release an employee assistance fund, which will allow staff to request a grant up to $2,000 per personal issue that they're having trouble with. So this could be unexpected medical expense, um, having unexpected car issues, having unexpected reason they have to move unexpectedly. And so we wanna support our staff um, by providing this grant opportunity. Um, we also have affinity groups at our organization. And so we have one for um, black affinity group. We have an Asian affinity group. We have an affinity group for LGBTQIA individuals. And we have an affinity group for people in recovery. And so those affinity groups are an opportunity for people to connect with coworkers and talk about what it's like to work in our field as a person of color, or as somebody part of the LGBTQI community. And so we're excited to offer those opportunities for staff to connect um, and support our BIPOC staff um, in what we do. So that's a little bit about us. Um, we do have immigrants. Um, who are working in a variety of positions for us. We have people from Liberia, we have people from Somalia, we have a lot of people from the Hmong community. Um, and so we do have good diversity in regards to people who have lived experiences as immigrants and, and recent arrivals into the United States. So I think that's what I wanna share today, but I can answer questions later when we get to that point. Thank you, Carrie. That was really helpful. Um, I think we'll go to Patty next uh, with Masonic Home. Sure. Um, if you're not familiar, Masonic Home is a long-term care um, and transitional care center in South Bloomington. And we also offer um, assisted living and independent living all on our campus. And um, with our, we have a very diverse workforce. We've been in in the, um, the community for over 100 years. And we're very proud of our, our workforce and what we're doing with our, um, our new immigrants and refugees that come to us. I think it's a very open community. We're very um, open to um, assisting in any way that we can and be flexible. I guess um, the question that was posed to me was how do we, um, what, what advice would we, I give to a new um, refugee or immigrant? And one of the things that I have seen a lot of success with is those folks that are willing to come in. A lot of people wanna come in and jump right into nursing and nursing is a, a, a great opportunity and there's a great career ladder that goes with that. And we are thrilled to help people um, walk through that career. Um, but I think it's helpful for somebody that's really new to our culture to come in and start maybe as a housekeeper or in dietary and um, have an opportunity to um, gain confidence in their language skills 
to, to earn some money to um, be able to, you know, maybe buy a car, or, um, you know, feel, feel confident with their housing and so on. And, and then get into a program for nursing assistance and, and move on um, up the ladder. We are fortunate that we are connected to a um, nursing assistant school so that um, those folks that come in and are, are um, wanting to go to that program, we can assist them with the tuition up front, which is a lot of time a hindrance to, to many people is having that initial um, lump sum to pay to get into the, the program. And we will assist them to um, do that up front and then give them flexibility with scheduling and so on so that they can do their classes. The, the fellow that does this program um, offers online classes and in-person classes and so on. So we're able to help most of our, our students that want to do that. And then also too, to, to help them with their scheduling so they can continue to work a few hours a week too, in addition to their schooling. So for me, that has been very helpful for people. And um, I think they have really appreciated that. They get to know the culture. Our industry is so heavily regulated that it's a lot just to learn all the, um, the terminology and how things are done and, and why we do things in a certain way. It just, it's got to be extremely overwhelming, you know, when you're first coming into the to the facility and trying to figure out why we do things a certain way. And, and so much of it is due to regulations. And um, once once they gain that confidence and understanding, I think that helps them a lot to understand, you know, going into nursing and so on and being able to move up that career ladder. Um, if they if they do determine they want to be a nursing assistant and we will assist they can go on to be a trained medication assistant then um licensed practical nurse rns we've we've had people go through the whole gamut and that's so exciting to see when when people move all the way up the the ladder to a case manager nurse manager assistant director nursing it's it's very exciting um, so I think we offer all those opportunities to people and we're very open to, to welcoming them and, um, and providing any flexibility and assistance that they need to be successful. Great. Thank you, Patty. Um, I think that's kind of a natural segue into, uh, into Julie's information. Yeah. So <laughs> welcome, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So yes, I think that the segue is um, that uh, so my name is Julie and I am with the International Institute of Minnesota Nursing Assistant Training Program. So anybody that might be looking to um, do that training first, do the nursing assistant training first, get the certification, then that is where we would come. And then we do also have employment counselors that can help look for jobs and, and at many different locations. So our training is uh, about to be 33 years old. And next week we are certifying our 3000th graduate. And so one of the things that I guess I want to say is that we um, really focus, we, are, we actually only accept people to our program that were born outside of the United States but have permission to work in the United States. So we have experience, you have experience, and we really know how to, we think we do a really good job at fitting all of those experiences together. We have two speeds of nursing assistant training programs. We have both of which are actually, I'm pretty sure the longest in the state because we want to give lots and lots of support of whatever that support looks like. And so for some people that is learning Minnesota and learning systems, like you were saying, some people it's learning English language, but not everybody. And some it's just so much to learn when you're here in Minnesota. Also just want to really start with saying um, thank you very much for anybody that is considering this career and that Minnesota needs you. Minnesota is lucky to have you to be thinking about this career and to be going and, and taking those steps that you might take to, to make that happen for yourself. At our program, we really um, believe or we know that the best way for adults to learn 
new content, new skills, new job is to be able to be doing that at the same time. If you're needing to learn new skills and new content and English language at the same time, we believe it's really good to be learning all of that at the same time. Don't learn English and then the content and then employment and then nursing assistant. It's And we do, that's why our program is longer. We think it, we are really successful because we teach all of those things at the same time. You get a lot more time and support with your with your instructors here at the International Institute. Um, I guess we have two different speeds. I'm sorry, I started to say we have a part time class seven weeks long, and we have a, a longer, more supportive 11 week class. And that all just sort of depends on your life, your experience, your background, and which one works best for you. And which one are you needing? Which one fits your life better? So we always have almost, almost every month, we have one of those groups starting and we just rotate throughout the year. We are always um, intaking and having conversations with you and seeing if you are interested. At the end of all of that, we have employment counselors that at the end of the training and getting certified, then we have employment counselors that work with you one-on-one -on -one to help you find the, the right fit for you, whatever is a priority for you. Some, sometimes it's location, sometimes it's shift, sometimes it is um, salary, sometimes it is that workplaces have a scholarship for you to go to college. This, this career, this field is really a, a great place. It has a true, true ladder that you can always be going and working towards. And, and we can support you through all of that. Um, Laura, like you were saying, there is, um, there's, there's nursing assistant, there's CNA program. There's also trained medical assistant. There's also phlebotomy. There's also, there's many, many steps that, and it's just wide open and healthcare can really be a wonderful field for that to be starting somewhere. Start, we're starting, starting with me, but then many, many future steps that you can take. I think that is all for now, right now. Great. Thank you, Julie. I think we're going to Sahil now, who's going to uh, um, facilitate some questions. Um, uh, thank you so much, everybody, all the speakers, uh, and for sharing what you do and how you are welcoming new American in your workplace and the healthcare education classes. Um, I would like to start uh, with Kerry, um, especially as you mentioned, you talked about honoring people's differences in creating a welcoming environment for the recent immigrants. Uh, what is one key insight in this area you would like to share with other caring, caring career employers? What would I, can you ask your question again? What would I? What is, what is one key insight in this area you would like to share with other caring, uh, caring career employers? Like uh, you guys have this, you know, a diverse environment and welcoming environment. And what is this one piece of advice you would like to give it to other employers that they can take and they can be benefit of it as well? Right, great. That's a great question. So the question being what insight would I share with other employers? I think it's um, to think big or think broadly. I think, you know, for us, there was sort of this ongoing hold onto, well, that's how we always did it. And traditionally we partnered very closely with universities and really targeted students who are in four year degree programs or targeting internship opportunities for people coming out of four year programs and a master programs and really helping people understand that the lived experience people coming in with um, is just as valuable and that it makes us better, all of us better in the support that we provide our residents because we're not all alike. We're not all coming from the same background and it's the mix of the backgrounds um, and lived experiences that really have helped us grow as an agency and grow in the services and support we provide our residents and clients. 
Um, and just to be patient, I guess, would be my second insight. It takes a little while. It's sort of sometimes two steps forward, one step back, but don't give up. You know, there's days where I still feel frustrated, but most of the time I feel really good about the direction we're moving. And so I think it's just, you know, you're on a path and we're going to get there and, and we need everyone to be part of that. And yeah, just take it slow, keep going. It's going to happen. Thank you so much, Katie, for such a great uh, advising and insight. Um, I will move on to ask Patty um, about, you shared the Masonic Home welcome new American employees. And uh, what is one key piece of advice you would like to share with the recent immigrant who want to work in long-term careers? Well, I think that it's a, a great opportunity to, to share their their caring heart and their willingness to, to help people. I see that with people from all over the world that come to us. We have people from every nation, I think just about. And um, ultimately, you know, we're all human and we all wanna um, care for one another. So I think it's just to, to be, like Carrie said, be patient. It takes time. It takes time to learn um, the culture and to learn our, um, our um, complex um, organization and and not that our organization is necessarily complex but our system here in America our healthcare system is very complex and there's a whole the terminology that goes with it and you know you're you're learning English and now you're throwing a whole nother um, set of terms and so it it takes time and ask lots of questions don't ever be afraid to ask questions and um, you know we have had to turn things so differently from the way we used to do things. I've been in this business for probably 40 years. Uh, don't tell anybody that, but um, it's a whole new world as far as how more open we have to be, more diverse, more um, flexible. You know, we used to, this is the way it is. These are the rules. This is how we go about it. And now it's like, wait a minute, how could we do this differently? Can, can we work with somebody's schedule differently? Can we um, get them into classes and then have them work a few hours a day versus everything is so cut and dried and black and white and um, just really needing to be flexible and helping people um, come at them where, where they are and, and help them to acclimate and um, and learn from them as well. Thank you so much for that. And even like from my personal experience with the other, um, you know, medical facility that I have worked with, especially uh, trying to, as you mentioned about the uh, nursing assistant program that you guys, you have, we, even other organizations, they would have kind of similar program and we um, sent some new Americans to those programs and they were basically not successful because, you know, they're, they were asking for a certain level of English that they, these applicants need to know. Uh, is there any certain level of the English um, requirement? Because obviously the new Americans, their English is not as proficient as, you know, um, a student has been, you know, graduated from high school or college here. Um, is, is there any, any specific, you know, level that, you know, can be, uh, you know, determine their eligibility? Um, you know, that's hard for me to speak to, I guess, you know, and I guess one of the difficulties I see our, our foreign born people struggle with the most is a lot of times they can communicate um, verbally and well understand and we can understand them well, but um, reading comprehension is difficult. So, you know, again, because we're so regulated, they have to be able to understand enough um, reading comprehension to be able to pass the, the appropriate tests and so on. So I think, you know, they have to have a certain level of comprehension that way. Um, as I said, the, the fellow that we work mostly with sending our people to for classes is a foreign born um, person as well. He was an RN for our organization for, for many years. And so he will work with um, the, the students too on their, not only the nursing assistant skills, but also on, on English and um, communication and interviewing skills and so on. So um, I think that's very helpful that it's not just a um, one and done type situation. You know, you, you, 
it, it, you do have to have a certain level of understanding. And that's why I sometimes recommend that, you know, and, and we will try and evaluate that upon interview is that, you know, I think you will be very successful. You want to do the job, but let's, let's start out in housekeeping or dietary or whatever, so you can gain some confidence in your English. And um, before we, we jump into the nursing assistant program. So um, kind of taking people where they're at and, and trying to assess that when we meet with them and, and try to um, get them to the right place so that they'll be successful. Thank you so much for this information. Thank you so much, it's really helpful. Um, I will move on to uh, Julie. Um, and I, as you mentioned, your organization, you know, I've, I've been, you know, uh, connected with your organization for uh, quite a long time. And um, I, even you mentioned your organization has helped so many recent immigrants prepare for employment, and especially in healthcare and uh, in other fields. Uh, what word of encouragement, uh, encouragement would you say to new Americans who may be listening to this forum or watching the recording afterward about gaining the English and health uh, healthcare skill to work in the caring career? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, re I really like that question and I thought about it for a little while and I want it from sort of two different answers that one I want to say just to remind people again of all of the skills and talents that you have even before coming to us. Um, that yes, maybe learning English and we will work on that together. Um, but I think that it, just given the name of this job, that sometimes that those English details are not most important because everybody, people can learn English. Mm -hmm. We can't learn how to care about somebody and how to want to um, do this, this kind of job. So kind of really wanting you to, to remind yourself of all of your skills and all of that you have already before coming to us. The other thing is that um, for support when and that you do need support, again, we have been doing it for thir more than 30 years and uh, we can do this, we can do this together. We will find a way, uh, we have done like I said, 3,000 certification next week that we are really excited about. So we will find a way to do this together and, and to be kind to yourself sometimes that it is just okay. We have lots of students that start our training, have to leave and come back months later. We are adults, adults' lives are busy, 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 and you have lots going on and um, you can go leave and come back and it will work out sometime whenever it's right in in your life that we can make that work together. Um, and again, yet, you know, we will just do this together. Um, looking at my notes, because I really liked the question. The you might be learning English. Not everybody is coming to Minnesota. Um, but even if you are learning English, that being multilang multilingual is an asset. Being yeah. multilingual is a benefit. Um, I am not, and I have to work so hard at this. And and many people might be coming into this field with multiple languages and so much past experience that, um, yes, there might be lots to learn right now, but you also do have, you are bringing so much to the to the field already. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for answering. Is um, uh, Nazanin here in the call? Is she joined us? Yes, yes, Sahil, I'm, I'm here. This is Nazanin. Oh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I know you, you, you were not here earlier. Um, I know you guys also working, your organization also working with the um, immigrants and, uh, you know, uh, new Americans. Um, just a quick question, you know, how, what have you found in biggest challenge for the recent immigrants in finding employment in healthcare, home healthcare, and how do you help them to overcome the barriers? Uh, Sahil, uh, you know, I provide home healthcare services. So the client, especially in best care, you know, we have um, clients from all, you know, different countries who speak all different languages and the, the services are provided in their homes. So sometimes, you know, we do have a request to provide, you know, a, a staff, you know, who might be 
you know, bilingual, who speaks the same language, and sometimes, you know, making the food that, you know, these elders are used to is a big thing. So, you know, we have been working with immigrants um, and trying to match these immigrants with the clients that we have, you know, who might have, you know, a similar background. Um, and being in home care, like I know the other speakers were talking about, you know, the, the training or the certifications or the, the criteria that's, that's needed um, to work in those fields. And for home care, it's, you know, it, the requirements, yes, of course, I mean, they have to have cleared the backgrounds, they have to, you know, have, you know, their skin test, which is also called a mantle test negative. Or, you know, we may just require, you know, a chest x-ray, which shows that, you know, they are not carriers of, you know, any of these communicable diseases. Um, but, you know, other, other than this, I mean, we, we require, you know, them to go through a training, which is in-house. And we have a nurse, you know, who would provide the training. And some of these are entry-level positions. So we, we have, you know, different services that we provide in the, under the home care license. So it starts with, you know, homemaking services. So homemaking service is basically you know, just cleaning or house management services. So they're not really touching the clients. Then a level up, you know, would be a personal care assistance. And I think, you know, people have heard about the PCA service. So it's called a PCA service. So under the PCA program, um, yes, you know, these people are assisting, you know, either the elderly community or the disabled community with, you know, doing ADL cares, which are daily living cares. I mean, that would be assisting them with bathing, dressing, grooming. We also do some light housekeeping and light cooking. And so all this training is provided to them in-house under a nurse. So we do not really require a nursing assistant license or a CNA license. So it, these are purely an entry level positions in the health field. This gives them an opportunity really to learn not only you know, the things that the people are needing, but also to really figure out if they really want to have a career in the health field there. So, um, you know, we do, you know, help them to, to identify, um, you know, what is a care plan. So some of the simple acronyms out there. And then, you know, we have close supervision that's provided to them if they need more training, because sometimes the condition of a client will change and the continuity of the staff is very important. So if there is you know, some additional training, we do provide that additional training. Um, I just want to add about the, the English language um, level that we need or what do they need? So yes, of course, I mean, most people like other speakers were saying, you know, they're pretty good when you are really talking to them face to face, but in home care, documentation is very important. I mean, in, in any health field, but in home care, documentation is very important. So we do really require them to understand the basic care plan. And then there is documentation that's needed, which we call it, you know, timesheet. So the timesheet basically tells them, tells us, you know, what services they provided on that given day. Um, so there is a little bit of English comprehension that is needed. Um, and of course, I mean, the, the caregivers have to be understood, you know, by their clients. So that's, you know, we are not really asking them to be very fluent in English, you know, so I think, you know, the, um, the international school and the others are teaching them, you know, some basic English language courses. And so that would be a big help for us to um, work, you know, in our home care area. Thank you so much, Nazemia. Thank you, everybody else, uh, for sharing such a great information. I think we are a little behind on the schedule, and I will just get back to uh, Rita. 
think we can go right to the assistant commissioner. I think he's introducing the next guest. Thank you so much, Tim. I really appreciate your insights into this uh, um, very important uh, uh, field of work that, that we have had so many questions about, and I'm glad that this is the right time to uh, carry this conversation. Um, the length of the call means important, uh, how important this field is, and we hope that um, our, our, stake, our community um, partners in the call will take up that uh, campaign and, and, and uh, put the word out there. Um, next uh, guest speakers we have is from the Department of Public Safety. There is a, uh, a language access tool that we were really excited about. Um, as you may remember, Anissa started working with the with the, on, uh, with, the uh, with Nicole, who was on the call, <clears throat> about the initial conversations of having a platform and uh, especially the driver services, uh, some sort of a language access, and that can help people to navigate through the complex. Uh, driver uh, services program. And now DPS is excited to have launched this amazing tool uh, that will help um, navigate to the, uh, uh, the website. I will not take much time. I'll hand over you to Nicole and you can give us more information about this. Uh, thank you, AC. Uh, good to be back, everyone. Uh, I'm My name is Nicole Archibald. I'm the Community Affairs Director for the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. And um, this project we're going to talk to you about today goes back a couple years uh, since it was first, um, you know, created. I guess that since the ideas came uh, and, the, and the technology capabilities um, became available. So, um, we have with us a team from driver and vehicle services that I have been working on implementing it and for the sake of time, uh, I want to see Rachel are you on the call because she's going to help us go through some things. Yes. Uh, gonna, okay, I'm going to share my screen first and I want to show you guys what we're going to do here so. Um, uh, AC can you nod your head if you can see my screen, you can see my screen yes. So um, this is called the virtual assistance and driver and vehicle services. Uh, announced this publicly last week. It's been um, it was it's been in place since about March. Um, just trying to you know, get it I get get the systems acclimated to one another. And uh, but what this is going to do is provide um, access to information and um, personalized information too. Uh, from uh, it's going to provide Minnesotans this inform access to this information in English, Hmong, Somali, and Spanish. So uh, I guess um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Rachel and she's gonna share a, a navigation and how to go through um, and find information on this tool. Uh, we also have um, Chuck uh, Yeager on the line from DVS too. So uh, Rachel and Chuck, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the presentation. Yeah, Chuck, did you wanna go first? Yeah, I can I can uh, introduce our, our area just real quick. Uh, so I wanted to give a big thanks to uh, AC Muhammad and everyone for having us here today uh, to learn more about DVS and to talk about this really exciting tool. Uh, my name is Chuck Yeager. I am the Business Relations Program Director for Driver and Vehicle Services. I oversee the group that does a lot of our MinDrive work, which is MinDrive is our system that handles all the driver's license and motor vehicle transactions in the state. Um, so a little bit about DVS, we handle driver's license, uh, issuing IDs, we do testing, vehicle titling, registration, among uh, many other things. We do those in person, online, by phone, over email, and through the mail. We have 281 offices across the state, and we process about 10 million transactions every year which is a lot of customer interactions. Um, DVS is committed to increasing language access for our customers when they need our services. And this project that Nicole uh, intro introduced is part of that investment that we're making. Um, we recently replaced DVS's e-services chat feature with a foundational Google AI technology that we refer to as our virtual agent. Currently, it is supported in English, Hmong, Spanish, and Somali, and is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we we uh, use that um, virtual agent to facilitate self-service uh, via the chat interface in all four of those languages. So it provides information and guidance and certain um, transactions directly in that chat bot. 
We deployed it, uh, as Nicole talked about, we deployed it at the beginning of March and we had a public announcement late last month. So far, we've seen a great response. We've had over 50,000 conversations. Um, and the end of May saw our very first time having over a thousand conversations in one day. Um, we are currently working on our next phase, which will introduce dynamic translation, uh, talk to text capability for more languages, uh, sorry, talk to text capability for Hmong and Somali. Currently, it's only available in English and Spanish. Um, and we're also going to be rolling out some other improvements. Um, so I just wanted to say that we want this technology to be the start of new and improved customer experiences for everyone in Minnesota who does business with DVS. Um, and the experiences that our customers have really matter to us, and we're invested in getting this product right. Um, one of those ways we're doing that, and I'm sure Rachel will, will demonstrate this, is uh, the customers have the ability to provide feedback directly to us through the virtual agent. Um, and we're able to look at that feedback and assess any changes that might need to be made. Um, and we're also really excited because we've been able to engage community groups to gather feedback. Um, we've had six community engagement group sessions so far, and we really look forward to expanding that. Um, and we're going to be hosting more in the future. And lastly, and I'll hand it over to Rachel, um, representatives from DVS will be at the Community Connections Conference at the Minneapolis Convention Center this Saturday uh, to discuss this tool and other exciting developments with DVS. So take it away, Rachel. Thanks, Jack. Um, let me do a quick screen share, pick the right screen. There we go. All right. Um, so I first wanted to show you where the virtual assistant uh, sits. Let me move this over. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, basically, the, the DVS's uh, website is drive.mn.gov. Very easy to remember. Um, and this is where all of our self-service interactions are uh, for customers. You can see we've got driver services vehicle, uh, as well as appointments for motor carriers, submitting forms. Um, in the bottom right corner of the screen is where you'll see our virtual assistant icon. Um, it says help and says, how can I help you? When you click into it, the first time you click into it, I should say, because I've, I've had it open, um, but this is where it would initially prompt um, a user to select their preferred language. So you can select either English, Spanish, Hmong, or Somali. Um, uh, just a disclaimer, um, I only fluently speak English, even though I do know a little bit and I've learned a little bit by working on this project, um, but I'm gonna select English. And there's a couple different ways that you can use the virtual assistant. Um, so initially it prompts and asks the user, how can I help you today and provide some buttons, um, some different ways that you can kind of interact with the agent. Um, but you also have an option down here at the bottom to enter basically um, a question or, or um, you know, put in uh, some, some terminology. The feedback that Chuck had mentioned, um, you know, if I click submit feedback, for example, um, it's going to basically push me into a uh, um, you know, a form of sorts. So it's gonna ask me to type my feedback below. Um, and this feedback can be um, really anything. Um, if it's related to the virtual assistant, um, you know, we take that feedback, we review it, and it helps inform any future developments or enhancements that we have. Um, if it's about your experience um, accessing DVS services, you know, we kind of triage out that information to the respective work areas as well. I'm just going to click return to chat to go back here. Um, uh, there's some other, um, Nicole had mentioned about kind of personalized service. And I don't have a great example because this is kind of live in production. Um, so I'm not going to pull up any personal information. But if, for example, I wanted to update the insurance on my vehicle, um, what I could do is I could put in my, uh, my plate number, the last three digits of my VIN. Um, submit that and it checks back into the system, it validates your information and then lets you add your insurance information. So it's a, an easy way to interact with, um, with these uh, different self-service actions. Um, you also have the option to 
um, you know, basically type what you want. So I'm just going to kind of give a quick example of a piece of new legislation. I know you guys were talking about legislation earlier on um, on the call, but driver's license for all is a piece of legislation that goes into effect this fall with um, uh, for for DVS. Um, and so this is an example of kind of the way that the, the system is designed. We were able to add new content um, based on the change of legislation or the the implementation of the legislation. Um, and so now we have information that helps um, bring the user to information. And then there would be links that will bring people to, um, right now we have a, a landing page for a driver's license for all, for different information, different informational events, resources, et cetera. Um, and just to kind of give you a little bit about like an example of like how it, it learns and processes, um, if I, asked kind of the same content, but maybe a different way, right? Like this, it's this idea that customers are using it with their terminology. So if I type to the, um, the virtual assistant that like, I don't have a visa, can I get a driver's license? I'm getting the same response. So like, this is what we programmed it for, but obviously there's other things kind of happening behind the scenes that will help make sure to route customers to the right, um, the right information um, as quickly as they can. Um, if I wanted to go back and again, select my language, um, and here is just kind of an example of, um, we just wanna let you guys see it in a different language. So these are the same you know, buttons that we had seen before. This happens to be in Spanish, um, but this is you know, for feedback. This is the frequently asked questions. If you speak Spanish, you probably can translate this more quickly. Um, but I can also similarly type, and I uh, use Google Translate to help me um, uh, translate this phrase, but this is uh, driver's license for all. Um, and then again, that would come back, oops. It always happens in a live demo. Um, okay, so my Spanish might not be um, on par here. So I will uh, move back out of that and I'll go back to English for just a second. Um, the other feature that I wanted to show um, to help customers um, with kind of engagement opportunities is we, again, I've been talking about typing a response, selecting a button, um, but you'll notice that we do also have this microphone feature. So um, right now for the languages for English and Spanish, we have speech to text, which if you click into the microphone, it's using you know the audio of whatever device you're using most of our customers would you know, be accessing this on their, their mobile device on their phone. It may take a moment to, <laughs> to load, but uh, basically it will transcribe your, your text. So this is in English. Um, in Spanish, if you speak in Spanish, it would transcribe it into Spanish. And then when you submit um, your question, then it would, you know, it basically allows you to not have to type. I know um, there were conversations earlier. We we know that a lot of uh, customers within um, a lot of our state services don't all have kind of or there's varying levels of of literacy, and um, we are excited about the speech to text feature because we know it's going to increase the access to more customers. Um, I think those were like the the things that I wanted to highlight, but I also wanted to make sure that. We had um, time to talk or answer any questions that may have come up um, or Nicole or Chuck, is there anything else that I may have missed? I'm trying to see, is there someone who has better visibility into the list or maybe unmute? I did not see any um, questions in the chat. Okay. There is a question. I see Mrs. Sahil has your hand up. Great. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this wonderful innovation. Um, you know, as uh, one of the biggest concerns, especially for the uh, immigrant community, is the the the, the knowledge test. Is this new technology will help any way uh, with the knowledge test to you know translate it or you know help with in the other languages besides English? Um, especially when you know the the, the new uh, law is coming in effect in the next couple of months, this will be one of the uh, biggest concern and you know and the biggest challenge for the immigrant and new American in the in, in Minnesota. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll definitely defer and Chuck, feel free to unmute if and when <laughs> appropriate. Um, so uh, the, the virtual assistant that we're looking at right now um, has a lot of the content to, to guide people to the content that's available um, potentially in other languages. Um, so from this landing page, we do have a multilingual resource center um, that will provide some of the different manuals available in different languages. So obviously the knowledge test is based off of the manuals um, that's available. We also have frequently asked questions available in multiple languages from here. And so, um, you know, we're working on adding more resources in other languages. Um, one nice thing about this technology is that, you know, right now, when we look at the technology, we have it um, available in the virtual assistant, but um, with future, you know, time and, and resources where we do have goals to continue to develop um, and translate more content to make it more accessible to more users for you know the reasons that you've, you've outlined. So I can also I can also add to that. Um, I know yeah. DBS has been looking at uh, ad expanding the languages in which the knowledge test is provided. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at Ukrainian Dari and Pashto. So we're hopeful that that will happen um, soon. The new Budget cycles turns over July one. Some you know some other um, sequencing and getting things in line and looking at the timelines for how we can get the projects done. But that is a priority for us. So thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll maybe pass it back to you, AC. Thank you so much. Really appreciate um, you have came, taking the time to join us, and thank you for having um, our office as part of the uh, <clears throat> project uh, since the, during the time of Anissa, and we have had great relationship uh, working with you all, and we were honored to be part of this. Uh, this is something that we hope to um, to replicate through um, state agencies and and bring language access in the center of the uh, state services that we provide to everyone. <clears throat> so thank you so much, and Nicole, and thank you for uh, getting the team together. Uh, we really appreciate it. If there are any questions, we'll just keep them on the chat and we'll answer as we go. But I think we can move on uh, to give more updates. And uh, after that, we'll open up for the remaining of the 10 minutes that we have <clears throat> for any open conversations. But I wanted to highlight two important updates. And, and the first one is, is actually uh, important. We have Alisa on the call that can talk to us about the, the, the um, rent help or the mortgage help that, that was going on for a while. And uh, Alisa has an update. So please feel free. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alisa Wetzelmore. I'm Community Development Director at Minnesota Housing. Thank you so much, Assistant Commissioner Mohammed, for letting me come and share this update with all of you today. So I know over the last year or so, I think we've been um, sharing different uh, updates about the Home Health MN program. That program um, is uh, one of the pandemic relief pro programs that can provide up to $50,000 in assistance to pay eligible past due expenses. So these can be things like mortgages, manufactured home loans, association fees, and property taxes. What's great is these, uh, this assistance does not need to be paid back. Um, homeowners facing foreclosure, tax for forfeiture, or displacement from their home will be prioritized in terms of assistance for processing. Um, as we've kind of shared, um, this program has a limited amount of funds and can only be open as long as funds are available. So we um, have very recently uh, made the announcement that we will move to a wait list this week. Um, this has been prompted because the program is close to paying nearly all of the available funds to homeowners. Um, so there is what's called an applications dashboard. I can put that in the chat. That just lets you know, you know how many funds have been applied for and then how many funds um, are remaining. So um, if you look at the dashboard now, you'll see that nearly all of the funds have been applied for. Um, however, of course, with processing time, there's, there's more funds that are still in processing. So it's possible of the applications that have been applied for, maybe some will be denied and some of those resources will still be available. So 
We really just want to get the word out um, that if you know any homeowners, again, including manufactured home or mobile home park communities that are behind on their expenses, to please apply as soon as possible. Um, the applications we receive prior to the wait list will still be reviewed subject to available funding. If there's additional funds available after we process the um, existing applications, um, any applications that are waitlisted will be prioritized based on their risk of housing displacement and the date and time that they submit it. Um, so I know this is limited time. Um, if people have any questions, I'm happy to quickly run through eligibility. Um, if you wanna give me a thumbs up or thumbs down if I should quick run through that. Okay, sounds good. So I'll quickly run through the eligibility. Um, you have to own a home in Minnesota and it's your primary residence need to be below the income limits. Um, they're relatively uh, kind of, um, they're not deeply, deeply low. And I can give you a few examples. For example, in Hennepin County, um, a household of, let's say four people um, is eligible if they make 117,000 or less. So there's different uh, income eligibility. In Aitken County, it's $90,000 for a household of four. Um, so that is the um, kind of income eligibility piece. Um, you need to have experienced a financial hardship after January 21st of 2020, have passed due expenses in one of the eligible categories that I, uh, and then um, again, it's only for past due expenses. The funds will be paid directly to the debt holder. It does not need to be paid back and it could be for expenses like mort mortgage payment, contract for deed, manufactured housing loans, property taxes, uh, property insurance, homeowner or condo association fees, and manufactured home lot rent. And then to apply, you'll need proof of ownership, photo identification, income documentation, and a copy of the statement for any accounts you're requesting payment for. One nice thing for income documentation is there's certain zip codes um, where you, as long as you can you know, affirm that you are within the income limits, those zip codes are considered proxy. And so just by living in that zip code, um, and your verification, that's all you need. So I'll put in the chat just the link to the Home Health website. Um, and then, you know, that's a good place to start. There's also, a, we have a, a hotline that you can call that's um, answered in multiple languages. And then, um, you know, we can go from there. I'll also put my information in the chat. This isn't, you know, I'm not an expert on this program. I'm just sharing the information. But if you want to reach out with any other questions, um, or just want to be connected, make sure you're going to the right place, please let me know. I do see the question related to anything for renters. So this program is kind of the program for homeowners that we had when we had Rent Help MN. Um, if you'd like at a future uh, session, I can give some updates about um, the over $1 billion that has been appropriated uh, or invested in housing uh, in Minnesota. And definitely there are some uh, funds at the legislature for um, rental assistance. So Mark to come, again, just the big update is just that we're quickly moving to a wait list. So we want to make sure that if you know anybody, um, please do get the, the word out. This is kind of the last uh, chance to apply. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I know someone asked me on uh, subject of availability of funds and uh, um, that was that is meant for the funds that are already um, given to the state from the federal government. So it's not like new federal money coming for them next year. Correct. So with home help, you know, with rent help, we did get additional funds um, over time. With home help, this is what we have is what we get. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really only as we're processing applications. If there's applications that are denied, then those funds will still be available to waitlisted applicants. Um, I'll quickly put the link to the dashboard in the chat as well. So that'll help you kind of, that'll help you see um, kind of how many funds have been applied for, how many funds have been approved and spent. There's also some interesting information related to distribution by race, race ethnicity, household income, um, and geography. Great. I see these uh, hand up. Um, yep.
Oh, I see a hand raised. Yeah. Can, can I speak now? Yes, oh, go ahead. Yes. Of course. Oh, thank you. Oh, uh, my, my name is Kamati Dam. I'm from the, the organization of Liberians in Minnesota. I couldn't get on the Zoom on town because um, hey, it's a very busy time. Uh, my question is that um, when the whole issue of brain help started a couple of years ago, we worked with CMRS and because people in our community find it very difficult to navigate the system in terms of filling the application and what have you. So it was much more easier with CMRS when we help as the community liaison to help people with uh, the application and how to access the system through CMRS. And then uh, two times in you know, 21, it changed and even now, and it became much more difficult for people to access those things. And the rate of people having eviction who want to court increased a whole lot. Uh, not many people in our community can go through the tedious process of going through the application, downloading information, uploading. My question then remains that with this remaining form, what best way do you think that people that are not very literate or people that have challenges going through the application to go to, what better way can you think that these people can be helped and especially those in my community? That is an excellent question. Um, so we do have a network of um, community connectors. Uh, we modeled that off kind of after the Department of Health model. Um, they're primarily for uh, engagement and outreach rather than that direct application assistance. Um, I think, although generally, again, just to understand the program and requirements, they are a good place to go. Um, I know, I think um, I see a few familiar faces. I don't want to call you out, but I think there's a couple of community connector organizations on this call if you want to, to chime in. Again, no pressure if you don't want to. Um, and then, uh, otherwise, I do think the the one eight hundred number is probably a good a good place to go if you want the to be able to talk through the question. Um, we did have a few application in person application sessions the past few months, um, but we will just because of the timing won't be able to have any additional um, application information sessions because it's quickly moving to close. Um, I should say, though, that there are homeownership counselors that can be really good resources and also help explain um, kind of the different documents you might need and things like that. So I'm happy to put um, that information in the chat as well and um, can follow up. I know it's a lot to <laughs> copy and paste from the chat, so I can also follow up with the assistant commissioner just to kind of have this all in one spot. Thank you, Lisa. I, I think we're, we're right on time. But just wanted to close up with another important uh, um, update. Uh, as you may know that the public health emergency is unwinding and uh, uh, there has been an increased Medicaid enrollment, the health, um, uh, we call the Medicaid programs or the um, health insurance <clears throat> that during the pandemic. So there was, because there has been um, continuous enrollment uh, or automatic enrollment during the uh, public health emergency uh, time. But now that is set to, to lapse and uh, wrap up, so there will not be automatic renewals. And, uh, and there's a concern that um, a lot of people may be disenrolled or some of the uh, sections of the society might be, you know, might, might, might get more affected. Um, and th there is a campaign by the Department of uh, Human Services uh, to uh, share that that the public health emergency is wrapping up, you will be required to update your information. You will be required to um, and send in um, the, the income, whatever applications and everything. So please do reach out, and I will share some information from DHS after the end of the call when I'm sending out emails. Um, do follow that that information. Reach out if you have any pro any, any issues or questions and make sure that you, um, everyone that you serve in the community 
have their you know healthcare insurance coverage and continue if they're eligible uh, so that they don't get disrupted um, in eligibility or uh, just because an address was not updated or um, a certain form was not filled. So be on the lookout, that is coming out soon and um, look for that um, campaign that from the DHS. Uh, so that's that, I will share more information on, on that. I do not see any other questions on the call and we're about two minutes past the call. I just wanna take a moment and thank everyone for joining us today. <clears throat> this has been really great. And um, one, one last update for our next call. Uh, we do this call first Tuesday every month. And uh, you guessed this right, the next Tuesday is July 4th. And that's a public holiday. So I will reach out uh, to reschedule uh, our call uh, sometime within July. And, and then the rest of the series will be the same. So that's also something to look out for. Until we meet next time, thank you so much for joining us. For those who presented, a uh, special thank you to you. And uh, thank you to everyone who answered, who asked questions and joined us on the call. Uh, until we see you again next time, bye-bye.